They now taunt, humiliate, degrade the prisoners in front of each other. From experiments in brainwashing to testing treatments and toxins on unwitting subjects, these terrifying human experiments are being dragged into the light. You might have seen this photo of a mouse with a human ear floating around on the internet, thinking it's Photoshop, but it's indeed real. Yep, scientists grew a human ear on a mouse. Up first are the Weipholm experiments. In the mid 30s, Sweden was struggling, not with fascism like the rest of Europe, but with cavities. No one really knew how cavities happened, despite them being everywhere. But people had an idea that sugary foods may have been a cause. So what did the Swedish government do? They force fed intellectually disabled patients at Vipholm Hospital with hyper sugary treats. It became clear pretty quickly that sugar was very bad for the teeth, but the results were actually restricted for years because the sugar industry no longer wanted this study, which it had funded, to be published. It turns out the government also had no idea this experiment was happening, as it had been labeled as a vitamin experiment, except the vitamins were exchanged for sugar two years into the study. Next is Kamera. Kamera, or the cell, was the central research facility for the Soviet Union's toxin programs. And like many things within the Soviet Union, Kamera combined cutting edge science with the inhuman cruelty of a lifetime of propaganda. For 70 years, from just after the revolution to the end of the Soviet Union, Union, this secret laboratory would take prisoners from gulags to test on, going through thousands of inmates who, obviously, had no say in their treatment. Numerous compounds were tested in the search of an untraceable, untastable, unsmellable toxin, eventually coming up with K2, which has been rumored to be the toxin of choice for the current Russian government ever since, being used allegedly on numerous Russian nationals such as Alexei Navalny. Next are the Porton Down tests. From 1916 to 1989, the full length of the Cold War, the British government experimented on 20,000 British soldiers, testing different gases, toxins, chemicals, and biological agents. As one story among tens of thousands, in 1950, RAF engineer Ronald Madison was given a 200 milligram dose of sarin, a potent nerve agent. He had been told that he was testing a cure for the common cold. He did not survive. It wasn't only British soldiers either. Thousands of Indian soldiers were also experimented on against their knowledge within India. The full consequences of this illegal human experimentation hasn't fully been revealed, as some soldiers likely had little or minor impacts while others perished on the spot. Most soldiers likely had an experience somewhere in the middle. Next is MKUltra. The Central Intelligence Agency is one of the most shadowy and unethical institutions in the nation and possibly the world, and MKUltra has come to exemplify exactly why they got that reputation. MKUltra was designed as an interrogation and brainwashing study and spent 20 years that we know of using every technique and method known to man to shatter people's minds and make them talk. This ranged from psychotropic substances and hypnosis to physical harm and repeated SA. In Germany, Japan, and the Philippines, they even established secret camps where they experimented on suspected spies and other expendables. The details of this program are utterly horrific, but even worse is that they don't even work. Oh, the CIA got very adept at shattering people's minds and breaking their connection with reality. It's just that people with shattered minds are completely useless for gaining information. They won't even realize that they're making things up. They're just so desperate to appease their captors that they will say anything to make the interrogation stop. This is why practically no usable information has ever been recovered this way, and actual information is gained through social engineering and rapport building. Next is Canotrovan. A lot of African nations have a pretty strong fear of doctors. Now, this isn't because of superstition or some fear of the modern. It is in fact very, very, very justified. In 1996, just as an example, Pfizer went to Nigeria during a meningitis outbreak and falsified a letter of approval for human trials. They gave 100 youths a very weak dose of the leading meningitis treatment and another 100 youths their own antibiotic, Trovan, trying to skew the numbers in their favor. 
11 youths would perish in the study and many others suffered long lasting health effects. Pfizer knew that the antibiotic was known to cause rather severe side effects, especially in juveniles, but leapt into human experimentation as soon as possible. They took advantage of the fear of a disadvantaged population during an outbreak that took 12,000 lives and told them either you participate in our study, which we won't fully disclose all the risks for, or you get no treatment at all. Next is the Beecher paper. In 1966, Henry Beecher, an accomplished doctor and researcher in his own right, published an analysis of 22 papers. These papers had all been widely published in widely read and respected medical journals. They were also all on incredibly unethical studies. In one study published, the subject was told they were going to be injected with some cells, while not being told these were cancer cells that they were being subjected to. The publishing of this analysis finally brought to the public's attention, for the first time really, the massive and rampant issue of unethical human experimentation. Experiments that were being published by respected researchers in world-renowned journals. The Beecher paper would lead to the establishment of the first ethics boards and committees, which seems like an obvious no-brainer now, but simply didn't exist in the 1960s. And finally, our frostbite tests. Have you ever wondered why we know so much about frostbite and how to treat it? Well, you have the horrific Unit 731 and Hisato Yoshimura to thank. Actually, please don't thank them. They do not deserve your respect. They took hundreds of people and experimented by freezing different parts solid and then trying out different techniques to thaw and heal them. Heal is a bit of a stretch, as the vast majority of test subjects simply had utterly inhumane and horrific things done to them. Hisato Yoshimura was despised even by other members of Unit 731. These are people who are testing fire throwers and diseases on live subjects, and Hisato was so brutal even they called him a cold-blooded animal. For the rest of his life, Hisato would show zero remorse for the hundreds of lives he took, and was granted clemency by the United States in exchange for his research. Those were terrifying human experiments the government tried to hide from you. I hope you learned something new, and I'll see you next time. Now the proper name of it, the Vincanti mouse was a laboratory mouse from 1996 who had what looked like a human ear grown on their back. Now the ear was actually an ear shaped cartilage structure grown by seeding cow cartilage cells into biodegradable ear shaped molds and then implanted under the skin of the mouse with an external ear shaped splint to maintain the desired shape. Then the cartilage naturally grew by itself within the restricted shape and size. So no, the mouse could not hear out of that ear and listen better but hey, it's pretty cool that they were able to do this. Now we have the Robot Monkey. Now, Robot Monkey literally sounds like the name of some sci-fi movie, but it's actually something that happened in real life. In May of 2008, experiments were conducted by Dr. Schwartz, a professor of neurobiology at the University of Pittsburgh, to teach a monkey to feed itself by using its thoughts in order to control a four degree of freedom robotic arm with shoulder joints, elbow, and a simple gripper. Now they gave the monkey two brain implants, one each in the hand and arm areas of its motor cortex. These monitored the firing of motor neurons and sent information to a computer, which translated the patterns into commands for the robotic arm. As a result, the monkey was able to manipulate the arm and it learned to use it to reach for food pellets, press buttons, and even twist knobs. Now I know this sounds a little crazy, but it's actually a good thing that that was happening. By putting the brain in direct communications with machines, researchers will one day be able to engineer and operate advanced prosthetics in a natural way to help paralyzed people live a close to normal life. Now, Vladimir Demikhov was a pioneer in transplantology, as he even coined the term. Now, after transplanting a number of vital organs between dogs, he wanted to take it a step further and create what we called the multi-dog. Now, Vladimir removed most of the body of a small puppy and grafted the head and forelegs to the neck of an adult dog. Now, the big dog's heart pumped enough blood for both heads, and when the multi-dog regained consciousness after the operation, the puppy's head woke up and yawned. Now, the Big Head gave it a puzzled look and tried first to shake it off, but remarkably though, both dogs kept their own personalities post-surgery. Though handicapped by having almost no body of its own, the puppy was as playful as any other puppy, and when the host dog got thirsty, the puppy got thirsty. When the laboratory grew hot, both host dog and puppy put out their tongues and panted to cool off. Now, unfortunately, the experiment wasn't a total success. After six days of life together, both heads in the common body died. Now, Ilya and 
Semyonovich was a Russian biologist born in 1870 who worked in artificial insemination. Ilya then wanted to get the sperm of animals and put them into different species to see what would happen. But in 1910, he told a gathering of zoologists that he thought it could be possible to create a human ape hybrid. In 1926, he and Serge Vonerov transplanted a human ovary into a chimp before attempting to inseminate her with human sperm. Now he attempted this two more times without success, so then he pitched an alternative approach to take sperm from chimpanzees and implant it into African women without their knowledge. Now, thankfully, the French governor said no to the idea, but Ilya then traveled to Abekazia with 20 apes and was able to convince people to be a part of this experiment. Five women or more volunteered, but no ape survived long enough at the ape nursery, and though he had women, Ilya found himself out of sperm. Now, before he could ship more apes, the Soviet Academy of Sciences heard about his plans to inseminate women in Africa, and all support for the project was taken away. Yeah, this is probably one of the most disturbing experiments I've ever heard about, and I'm glad that he was stopped because, oh my god. Yeah, I think some of these scientists needed to be stopped because some of these were absolutely crazy. 